And today, um, our time is short and we want to focus on discussion. So I have a PowerPoint presentation, um, which is built up probably on two different parts. First is giving you some background on the issue of what a steady state uh, could mean for business and production, where the problem arises. And the second part is the proposals. I only have two proposals for you. And the proposals, uh, some of you probably saw me in London earlier this year. Um, and there I focused on what a company itself could do. This proposal is probably, or the two proposals I have right now, are probably more aiming at um, policy makers, what they can do in order to help companies uh, uh, redirect their focus from growth uh, away to a more sustainable uh, manner of, um, of, uh, of business, doing business. We can, of course, then discuss all the other proposals that I didn't make, and probably you have, have, uh, have some additional proposals, uh, in the discussion section, but I will only focus on these uh, two proposals. Uh, so, to, to start off, Peter Victor uh, uh, this morning uh, uh, was referring to, uh, uh, for example, the growth in material extraction, the growth in resource use and all of this. And he, he, I think he used very dramatic words and, uh, and the situation is dramatic. I try to um, just put up a slide from the Living Planet report from the WWF that is referring also to data from the uh, International uh, Ecological Footprint Network, uh, which is a, has a wonderful website, footprintnetwork.org, which you really need to check out. And uh, uh, with this matter, the ecological footprint, and Peter was explaining to you what this actually is doing, um, you can really uh, try to, to picture how much, uh, how much planets we use for our uh, uh, pr uh, production activities. And as you can see, uh, around the early 1980s, we were uh, within the limits of uh, the resources and sinks uh, that the uh, Earth uh, provides us. So up to uh, 1984, maybe, or 1983, depending on how you measure it, we were using up to one planet. This is this one. And if you look for the second um, point in time, roughly about uh, 2010, uh, where we are now, we're using probably 40% more than nature can regenerate in a given time period in a year. That means we need 40% more of the planet Earth. And if we continue this uh, by 2030 or something, or, or in the 2030s, you cannot really say exactly when, but then we will need two planets. Of course, from, from probably this point onward, this is just a hypothetical uh, 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 diagram because uh, we cannot overspend nature uh, in this matter. So at one point this curve will uh, go down and will collapse. Um, but this is really the, uh, the issue that is at stake here and the problems we're all facing that we're really using much more uh, ecological space that is uh, available. Um, and the question for me being uh, a management uh, person and being educated in this is how can businesses react uh, to this? So the first motif for me was not uh, to, to ask, okay, what can uh, the government can do by introducing new taxes? Or this is also important, but this is not my main focus. My main focus always was, can businesses out of themselves do something? Uh, do they have to grow? Uh, or where does this, this, this uh, impulse to, to more growth and more profit, where does this come from? Is it possible doing it uh, without, uh, without growth? Um, so this is my, my kind of background. I was thinking, what uh, what can be done about it? And there are two kind of strategies that are available uh, for companies, not only for companies, but probably especially to them. And these kind of two strategies, uh, just to give you another background, uh, is either uh, playing the efficiency card, uh, eco-efficiency with new products, technology innovations like uh, 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 fuel-efficient cars or new kind of engine technologies and all this, um, and uh, uh, betting your, your whole money uh, on the possibility to, to decouple economic growth and its ecological impact. And suddenly you arrive at a, at a, a paradigm of sustainable growth or green growth. And you've probably heard this also in the, in the media in the UK and that this is sort of a goal for, for government to achieve uh, sustainable growth or green growth as if you could really kind of do this and decouple completely what you do in the economy from what is happening in the ecology. The underlying um, uh, paradigm, uh, the, the basic assumption, is that of this triple bottom line. 
So that there can be sort of a balance between economic, ecological, and social goals. So this, in Germany, we say as a three a three spheres model. So and if you uh, somehow can can leverage it and balance it, then you can have uh, probably growth uh, without uh, all these uh, uh, ecological pressures and so on. And this is uh, uh, if you if you look for uh, sustainability reports from companies, you always see this kind of model, the triple bottom line. You always see these three bubbles and say, okay, and, and we do this, and uh, so we can have our economic activities without harming the environment or uh, society. Um, the reality, of course, is there is a dominant bubble, and the dominant bubble is of course the economic bubble. So if uh, uh, if it is uh, bringing down costs or if it's increasing profits, then we will do it, and then it's probably uh, ecological beneficial or social beneficial. So this is really the, uh, the dominant idea that you can do something for the economy today and do something for the ecology a bit later or so after you earn the money. Um, the other strategy is uh, uh, the sufficiency strategy. Sufficiency um, uh, is uh, aiming also at innovation, but not so much on technological innovations, but on behavioral innovations. So changing uh, what people are actually doing, how they use a product, what kind of products they're buying, or for companies, what kind of products they really are selling, or probably not selling, probably they start selling a service like uh, 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 the example of uh, car sharing that I used in London earlier this year, and we probably can talk about this as well. So sufficiency means really an absolute reduction of material throughput, uh, also via the means of less products. Uh, and Peter Victor was telling that the efficiency uh, focus is only focusing on a reduction on a relative scale. So you get more fuel efficient cars, but you get a lot of more cars. So And this will eat up all efficiency gains in, in the long run. Uh, and probably the paradigm for, for uh, sufficiency is really much more on the good life uh, itself and what this means. And uh, the, the paradigm there, uh, the assumption, is that the economy is somehow embedded in an environment, in a societal environment, and in a natural environment. And when I'm uh, telling this to, to graduate students, I always say that the economy lives on prerequisites that it cannot produce itself. So it cannot produce a good skilled workforce. It cannot produce uh, democratic uh, institutions or social stability or emotional stability or, or love or whatever. Uh, if the economy tries to produce love, we call this prostitution. And if an economy tries to produce political stability, we call it corruption. So, uh, so the economy can only do what the economy can do, uh, and for the rest it needs other environments to supply it with. So this is a totally different view, because then the, the hierarchy is pretty much clear. If the environments of the economy are not working anymore, the economy can also not work. So this is really a fundamental, uh, a fundamental difference. Now, uh, coming, uh, coming to um, uh, the issue of uh, depots and the firm itself, um, this is really uh, uh, a debatable uh, thing. Uh, there are some who say, okay, we can have uh, a, a lowered uh, a scale and a depot in the economy within existing uh, market systems uh, because profit and growth are different things. And the others say, no, we cannot have it because growth and profit are so closely interconnected that the one drives the other. So if you have profit, you always want to have a bit more profit, and so the growth part of it is not. Um, well, I think that indeed profit and growth need not be connected, because um, the only thing that you need for a company, or the only thing in terms of, of money, uh, is that you can pay off all your bills. And this is what you can uh, term with uh, capital costs. Capital costs is everything that a company needs to pay, be it the worker salary, be it the salary of the managers, uh, be it the investments you need to do, also pay off probably, you can even include a shareholder's uh, 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 salary in there. So uh, the only thing uh, that uh, an economy, uh, a corporation needs to do is uh, ensure that their revenues exceed their capital costs, or at least match the capital costs. If they exactly match, the economists say you have an economic profit of zero, and this is uh, the desired thing. Everything else is nice to have, but it is just that, nice to have. Um, so as soon as this uh, minimum condition is, is, uh, is fulfilled, uh, an economic organization can continue its operation as an economic organization, so it doesn't need to become a charity, so it still can work um, uh, uh, as, a, as an organization of the economy. 
Um, however, um, there is another kind of well-being that I try to uh, introduce, and this is the ecological well-being, uh, because every, um, of course, everything uh, what the company does uh, is connected to ecological impact. So, uh, so when you say total revenue, so for your sales or something like that, of course this has an impact on the uh, natural environment, probably via the technology you use. If you use a combustion engine, uh, uh, it has a different uh, impact than if you use, for example, fuel cell or so. Uh, if it's less, I don't know, uh, but uh, you get what I, what I mean. Uh, and the idea with ecological well-being is that every company has something that you can call an ecological allowance. So this is uh, uh, sort of a footprint for a for a company. How big the ecological, uh, how big does how big uh, the ecological impact impact of a company is allowed to become. So if these two kind of uh, uh, conditions uh, are met, that uh, capital costs are lower than total revenue and total <coughs> ecological impact is lower than the ecological allowance, you have what I would term. Uh, uh, sort of a, a right size profit. This is what uh, in the first quarter here. This is the the uh, this is for me uh, uh, the sustainable uh, organization or the sustainable business. This is synony synonymous with that. Um, the other thing, the other quadrants, as you can see, on one hand you are economically well, but you run into ecological access. This is probably the one thing that we have uh, most. Uh, uh, on the other hand, you have an economic loss. And uh, the fourth quadrant is the most uh, least desirable. This is the eco eco disaster, uh, where you uh, uh, run into troubles on both on both ends. Today, we don't have any measures for ecological well. No measures that we employ can really say how big is is enough for a company. We have relative scales. Uh, we have relative scales. If a company is is more environmental friendly, the year after also something like this, so have we reduced waste or have we reduced emissions or do our products reduce less emissions or whatever, we can probably calculate these things. But we don't have sort of a footprint for companies in the sense that we can say three tons per year per, I don't know, unit produced you, you're allowed to, to have or something. We don't have a, an absolute measure and this is the probably the, pro the problem that I see for companies that they don't have a, a, a measure, an uh, absolute measure of how big their ecological footprint is allowed to be. And as you can see, I hope that no, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Okay, anyway, um, uh, the uh, the normal uh, movements, the normal strategies, always go from this to this here. So this is the favorite movement because you want to to uh, to get into this position. Oops, sorry, this position. Oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> I go it's a big iPad. Oh. Anyway, so um, you, you just move into this direction, um, and only probably by accident you move into this into this direction. And the big task would be to to, to move this dominant direction around and and, and, and uh, move it into this direction of right size uh, right size profits. This is for me the biggest uh, uh, question that we have to answer. How can we do this? And these are kind of different strategies that would be needed. Uh, to, to achieve this. I won't discuss these strategies in detail, but maybe we can uh, have a discussion uh, uh, later on. So, what I'm proposing now to heal the world, uh, at least uh, on two issues. The first issue um, is the issue of measurement, as I said. Um, uh, you can only manage what you measure, especially if you're in a corporate environment. Uh, what matters is that there is a number on the bottom right and either it should be as large as possible or it should be as small as possible. And if you have a number, uh, you can do something with it. If you're talking with managers and you say about, and you talk, talk with them about uh, behaving sustainable or something, uh, they immediately ask you back, okay, what is that? So how do I know if this is sustainable? I mean, we're reducing waste, we're doing this and we're doing that, but is this, am I becoming more sustainable? Uh, if I have a measure, then I can justify decisions. So uh, the first really important thing for companies is to have a measure, and this would be, of course, also t uh, uh, something for policymakers uh, to really um, uh, either fund research towards creating such a me measure or providing sort of a, um, I don't know, a, a point of reference for companies where, where they can probably go to and see how how they perform against this measure. There is something in the UK something called carbon. Uh, where you can. Uh, how is it called? 
Yeah, I think something like this, and where, 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 so where all companies are rated or something. Yeah, exactly. So companies need something like this, uh, because then they can start playing the games they, 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 they are used to. So, ah, we can become, become bigger or smaller, you know, and this is good. So we can do it. Probably you, you have uh, probably experienced it for yourself if you, if you own a car. Shame on you. But anyway, if you own a car, um, uh, they uh, introduced also uh, how much fuel you are now using per mile or something like this. And this is a new type of measure. And I think it was Audi uh, who, who, who done a, a commercial uh, where two guys are driving around their cars and then they're meeting at night and they're okay, uh, 5.1, and the other says 4.9. Damn it! And then they drive off again and try to, to beat each other and have uh, the lowest uh, fuel. Um, um, well, anyway, it's, it's sort of it's, uh, contradicting the thing. But as soon as you have sort of a measure, you start to trying to to, to, to get it. And so this is really a, a first thing. I try to to we don't have to get into the detail. Of this we can discuss this. How you can do this uh, this calculation? How big is just right? Uh, because this is really not trivial. How to do this for a company? For a company, I think the easiest way to do it is going for carbon, because carbon is, by natural laws, very closely connected to the production process and anything that is done with a product. So probably carbon is the, the waste of the day or the emission of the day that we can really use for calculating a, a sort of a, a, a measure. So trying to, to have sort of a global cap for uh, per annum carbon dioxide emissions, trying to somehow relate this to uh, world industry production, Maybe you can even calculate it for different industries um, uh, and build a sort of a ratio of carbon dioxide and world income contribution of world industry production. This is important. How much does production contribute to world income, to world GDP? And, and you can probably divide this, uh, as I said, into different industries or different countries or whatever um, and use this ratio, which I call, I think it's kappa, you know, right, uh, to calculate the individual ecological allowance for carbon dioxide for a company uh, if you just multiply it with the uh, total revenue. So this is very, uh, very just a first thought how you do it. Um, I will present with a colleague of mine, uh, hopefully a small case study at a conference in Italy in October, I guess, uh, where we try to present this and how feasible this is. But this is really uh, the first steps into such an abs absolute measure. So this is one thing, try to uh, um, uh, develop such a measure. This is something for policymakers, also something for academics to provide companies with something that they can really use for measuring how big this is just going. And the second thing is, uh, as Anna said, but I was also educated in economics and law, um, it's about uh, the legal form of corporations. And this is really an issue that um, I think is very important uh, to get out the uh, the sting of growth of companies to think about what uh, if there are any structural um, uh, issues here that drive companies for growing and of course a shareholder corporation has this kind of uh, impulse for growth in it uh, if you don't have very nice shareholders um, and so three different types of corporation or forms uh, uh, might be an interesting alternative or could be developed into an alternative and uh, the issues for policymakers would be to make these uh, uh, legal forms attractive for business, that you can really easily set up such a thing or transform your business into one or somehow fuse uh, uh, the issues. And I just take up three and I think you're mostly familiar with cooperative organizations and foundations. I don't know how much of you are, are familiar with low profit limited liability companies, LFC, which is a, a quite a new thing. Uh, so I just will skip through um, some of these um, uh, forms. A cooperative uh, it's, it's quite an old form, and it is, I think it goes back to a start as I found out. Um, uh, and uh, the cooperatives are really focused on a common goal or, or, or something beneficial for its members. So actually it's like a household turned into an organization in a way. It can also sell stuff to other people who are not within the, co uh, the cooperative. But this is the first idea that um, economic actors come together, help themselves, and, uh, are, and make their own kind of organization and their own uh, business and so that uh, the ownership of, uh, uh, of the uh, organization and uh, the workforce, uh, the investors and even the one who benefit from it are identical. And the interesting thing about cooperative is that in recent years there have been in numerous countries 
uh, especially also in Germany, uh, a change in cooperative laws to make them more attractive. I think in Germany it was in 2007 or 2008 or so, uh, when the cooperative law, which was 100 years old or so, was, was changed in a way to make it more attractive and more easy to, to build a cooperative, even to have a limited cooperative, so with a limited liability in all this. Um, and, and I think since 2006 you have even the opportunity to have a cooperative on the European level, the SCE. Uh, it's a new organizational form uh, that you can choose if you don't want to have a, uh, a normal uh, limited uh, uh, on the European level, you can also have a cooperative on the European level. So this is quite interesting that there is some movement into this, uh, but I think it could be done probably even better or help probably normal normal, uh, that is normal, uh, uh, corporations probably to be a member of, of cooperative organizations or the other way around, so to, to make sort of a network of these different organizational types. The uh, foundations, as you know, as a non-profit organization, um, it's uh, in Germany and I think also in Britain that sometimes corporations are owned by foundations. Uh, in Germany this is with the Robert Bosch GmbH, which is a, a limited foundation which is also very interesting that the German uh, organizational laws allow this type of, of, of mixture. Um, and, but you have numerous others. Uh, some of you might know the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, big German daily newspaper. Uh, and this is, they are also owned by a foundation. Um, and uh, Carl Zeiss, which make Optio Electronics, uh, they are also owned by a foundation. Um, and uh, probably something that everyone knows, uh, Mozilla Corporation, uh, uh, this, the legal rights, the patents, of this corporation are transferred to a foundation. So they are interesting uh, examples how ordinary corporations and foundations kind of mix in a way. And it would be, I was just giving this a food for thought, an interesting idea. If you have this profit that is beyond what you probably need to sustain uh, in, your, in your business, it would be an interesting idea to transfer this to a foundation that then, that then probably do some social ecological project either in local communities or in uh, developing countries. So, uh, 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 this is an interesting idea to, to probably discuss later on uh, how this mixture of foundations and organizations can probably benefit the goal of, of getting the growth impulse out, out of, of businesses. And the last and uh, newest one is the L3C, uh, the Low Profit Limited Liability. Uh, it has been around in the US for I think only two years or so, in several US states it has been introduced. It's sort of a hybrid organization of a non-profit and a classical profit. Um, and you need to have a charitable goal and everything uh, uh, for it. And as I was looking through, I was suddenly found out that I am partly working for such a thing. In Germany we call this uh, Gemeinnützige GmbH, Public Interested Limited. And uh, as I found out, uh, there are even public interest corporations uh, or the possibility to set up something like this. Um, and these uh, kind of, they are allowed to have profits, but only very low profits. Um, uh, so, and uh, the, the company that I'm partly working for as a, as a part-time job is an independent research institute that is organized in this form. Um, the interesting thing is that uh, in the German case, uh, they don't pay any corporate taxes. Uh, and they're allowed to give, uh, um, to give a donation to get a tax receipt for it, so you can, they can do this, for example. And uh, it's uh, something similar happening in the, in the UK with the so-called community interest conferences. So uh, these are kind of three forms of organization that might be uh, a really an interesting alternative or an alternative to be developed into some uh, uh, for having an organizational form of business without the growth impulse uh, in it. Um, 23 minutes, uh, so I will just stop like uh, here. I, what I didn't mention is, for example, what companies themselves then can do, for example, by uh, uh, establishing close links with their customers, and probably have sort of a reverse learning process about product and product use, and change the business model uh, away from products to services, uh, or from away from production to, to, to the entire life cycle. This is something that I didn't mention, but I think we can discuss this issue if you like. So that's it uh, for me, and now uh, I'll hand it over to Ed. Thank you. Thank you, Andre.